Well, good morning. Hi. Last week, if you remember, we left Jesus with his disciples. And we went, left him at what we typically call the last, the Passover meal, where he instituted the Last Supper. And you remember when he instituted the Last Supper, that isn't in the book of John. Instead, John covers something that the other Gospels do not even discuss. Instead of John talking about the Last Supper, it's the same occasion, but what does John talk about? The washing of the feet. So he's emphasizing the washing of the feet. Now John has a very specific purpose in doing this. John is trying to get them to understand the disciples to understand that they have to love each other. Now you'd think, after three years of being with Jesus, you could understand that you need to love each other. But I'll tell you something, <laughs> they didn't. You'd think, after years of being with each other, you'd think we understand we have to love each other, right? But I can tell you I'm not always good at that. It's hard for me to love some of you. <laughs> Not looking at anyone in particular. <laughs> That's true, I must love you, and it's hard for me to must love you. <laughs> so what we have is... <laughs> so what we have is... We have... John is trying to tell us this particular event because he's trying to make a point. Now remember what John is doing. John is writing much later than this event happened. This event, when John is writing this, these events took place 60 years before. Think of your life where you were 60 years ago. Some of you can't go back that far. Some of us can, but I don't really remember it. But when you, you, you got to put this whole thing in context now. Jesus is with his disciples. Jesus now tells them that I have got to leave. I am going to go to a place you can't come to yet. And because I'm going to go to this place, they begin to get really worried. Now you think about this. For three and a half years, you've been following this man. Now he tells you, I've got to leave. This had to have a great impact on John. So it's uh, stunning to me how John could remember this whole event. Here's what I think is going on. It's like if you have your best friend that tells you, I know I'm going to die tomorrow. And your best friend sits down with you and says, here's some things I want you to know before I die. I can guarantee you if that happened, you would remember it. You would remember it even 60 years later because that, that would make an impact on you. So when we encounter this long discourse from Jesus, in John chapter 14, Judas has already left. Judas Iscariot has already left. John's now talking to the 11, and he's trying to explain to them, here's what life is going to be like when I'm gone. Thomas says to him, verse 5 of chapter 14, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the road we need to take to get there? And Jesus says, I am the road, or the way. I am the truth and the life. The road is, you need to follow me. Now remember, John has seven I am statements in his book. This is the sixth statement. If you look at him on the board now, do you see the impact of what John has said? He has remembered that Jesus said he was the bread of life, 
the light of the world, the gate for the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, and now he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Do you see that John is trying to tell us something in this book? Because I can tell you, in 95 AD, when John is writing this, there is a huge problem in the church. The huge problem is, people are having trouble believing. You know why they're having trouble believing? Because they're starting to argue with each other. They're starting to fight among each other, the believers are, about what you have to do to be a believer. And that's discouraging many people. And so John is trying to say before he dies, remember what Jesus said. You've got to keep this whole thing in context. Jesus tells him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Philip says to him in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, that'll be enough for us. Now, can you imagine that? Philip saying, show us the Father. What's Jesus' answer going to be? I have shown you the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He goes through this and he says, verse 11, Believe me when I say, I am in the Father, the Father is in me. Or if you can't believe that, at least believe in the miracles that you've seen. Can't you see that I'm doing things through the Father? I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Now when he says, he who has faith in me, who is he talking to? He's talking to those eleven. This isn't a general statement to all of us. He's saying to you eleven, if you have faith in me, you will do greater things than I have done. Here's what I thought of when I read that. I thought of Peter in Acts 5, 15, where the shadow of Peter passed over a person and that passing of the shadow over the person healed the man. I thought of Diseases that were cured and demons that were cast out because Paul touched hanker or yeah, Paul touched handkerchiefs and aprons that the people had. He didn't even have to touch them. I thought of Ananias and Sapphira being struck dead by Peter. Are those greater things than Jesus did? And why were they done? They were done to show that the apostles had the power that Jesus had. He's saying, I'm going to give you the power that I had. I can think of uh, the sorcerer struck blind by the word of Paul. I can think of that the apostles preaching in more than just where Jesus preached. They spread the word everywhere. Were they greater than Jesus? Of course not. But did they do things that were greater than what Jesus had done? Yes. How did they do it? Through the power of Jesus. So when he says that, don't take it out of context. When he says that in verse 14, you may ask me for anything in my name and I'll do it. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the disciples. Don't take this like a health and wealth preacher will take it and say, if you today ask for anything in my name, I'll do it. That isn't a promise to us. Now, there are promises to us that are very powerful. But here he's talking specifically to those disciples. So don't take this statement in John to mean something it never meant. Let's go on. This is, a powerful, this is a powerful discourse that Jesus is giving. And when, it, when you think of this, I want you to think of the other time that Jesus spoke at length. Not recorded in the book of John. What's the other time Jesus spoke at length? The Sermon on the Mount. John doesn't even mention it. The Sermon on the Mount tells you how you have to behave. What is this 
saying. This one is saying how, that you have to believe. You have to believe. If you can't believe, then you're not going to be saved. You must believe. Verse 35. He says, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. <laughs> oh boy, we've taken that one and distorted it, haven't we? We make commands of Jesus that he never made. You say, what are the commands of Jesus? Hang on, we're going to see them in chapter 15. In 15, chapter 15. Yeah. So this is 14, 15. He says, if you, if you love me, you'll obey what I command. And I will ask the Father, he'll give you a counselor to be with you forever. To be with who forever? To be with the disciples. He's talking to the disciples. The, uh, these 11 apostles. Um, he calls them disciples here. and it, it, for, So in this context, uh, yeah, I mean the 11. But uh, you're right, the disciple can mean a lot more. But here he's talking to the 11. Now he's saying, the 11 are worried that Jesus is leaving. So what does he tell them? I'm going to send you someone else who's going to help explain things to you even after I'm gone. So the promise is someone is going to explain things to them because Jesus didn't get everything explained to them. So he says, I'm going to send the spirit of truth to you. Verse 19, before long the world will not see, anymore, see me anymore, but you will see me. How are they going to see him? Because they're going to see the spirit of truth. And that spirit of truth is going to point them to Jesus. Because I live, you will live. What does he mean before, because I live? Jesus, they know he's going to go die. He just told them he's going to go die. Because I live, because I'm going to be resurrected, you will will also know that you're going to be resurrected. You're going to live. You're also going to understand what life has to be. On that day, you'll realize I am in the Father. You are in me, and I am in you. He's saying, I am in the Father. You are in me. I want you, my disciples, my, my eleven, to be as close to the Father as I am. Do you see how these words are comforting to these people? Verse 21, whoever obeys, has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He's talking about his commands again. Verse 22, Judas, and it tells us in the Bible there, not Judas Iscariot. This is Judas who wrote our book of Jude. So it's that uh, disciple, that apostle. But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? You see, he's specifically talking about us, the eleven. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They are, belong to the Father who sent me. He's saying... Yeah, other people in the world, if they come to love me, they will also see me, right? So he's trying to encourage them to still believe. Then in 25, he says again, I've spoken these words while I'm here, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, he's going to teach you all things and remind you, remind you of all things. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled. You've heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you loved me, you'd be glad I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I told you before it happens, so that when it does happen, you're going to believe. I will speak with you much longer. I will not speak with you much longer, for the Prince of the world is coming. Who's the Prince of the world? Satan, evil. The prince of the world is coming. He has no hold on me. <laughs> but the world has to learn that I love the Father and I'll do exactly what the Father has commanded me. 
what's Jesus saying he's going to do? He's going to die. And he's saying, you need to understand this. This is what I mean by love. Now he's going to talk about this, and he gives us... And that's a really good point. He's specifically avoiding the words, I'm going to go die. He's saying, I'm going to go live. <laughs> and so he's deliberately trying to make a point with them that it's only through my death that I live. And he doesn't use the word death. That's my word. Then he comes and he gives us chapter 15 the seventh I am statement. And what is the seventh I am statement? I am the true vine. And what does he explain to the disciples that they are? They're simply branches. What's God in this picture that he's creating? He's the gardener. Because what's, what's God doing? He's pruning the branches. He's pruning the disciples so that they will be fruitful. If He doesn't prune them, they can't be fruitful. So He's got to cut out from their minds these thoughts that they don't understand and He's got to allow them to grow things in their minds where the Spirit can flourish. He explains that with the branches. And then he says, verse 9, chapter 15, verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now you remain in my love. If you obey my commands, there it is again. You'll remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in love. I've told you this so my joy can be in you and your joy can be complete. My command is this. That's what we've been waiting for, right? What's his command? Love one another. Now, how is he showing his love? He says, well, greater love has no one than this that one lay down his life for, our, for his friends. You're my friends. If you do what I command. I don't call you servants anymore. A servant doesn't know his master's business. I call you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you to go and bear fruit, fruit that'll last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. What does he say again? Love each other. He commands them. I mean, how many times do you see that in these chapters, in this discourse? Jesus is telling them, here's the last things before I die that I want you to remember. And what does he keep saying over and over? Love each other. Love each other. All of us will sin. We have to love each other even when we sin. We have to love each other even when we disagree with each other. We have to love each other even when we don't like the behavior of certain people in our lives. We're to love each other. Now that's pretty simple, right? <laughs> and it's very hard. The words are simple, but the, the task is hard. Go ahead. Good place to stop. 
That is a great place to start, and it's where we need to all start. All right, now, look at what he says to him in chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. Now, he goes on in here. Look at this. Look at verse 20. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you too. But if they obeyed my teaching, they'll obey yours. They're going to treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. What they're saying, he's saying is, I was persecuted, you're going to be persecuted. Now, why is John so remembering this in 95 AD? Because they've been persecuted. Because he may be the last one who is alive. And John is reminding them now, why are you dying? You're dying and being persecuted because you want to be like Jesus. And Jesus had to die, and that means you have to die. Now, I'll tell you that there was a, there was a big dispute in the church about 96 AD because uh, Domitian, who had been persing, persecuting the Christians, um, when Domitian died, the persecution stopped. And so now, there were Christians who had been martyred because of their faith. And there are other Christians who went before the governor, and when he said, if you just will worship this, then if you'll worship this idol, if you'll worship the sun god, then you don't have to die. And there are Christians who said, okay, I'll worship the sun god. But I know in my heart, I haven't changed. But it's more important that I live. So there is a dispute going on in the church at this time whether those Christians who gave up under persecution and renounced Jesus should be accepted back in the church or whether they should be rejected by the church because they renounced the church. In other words, can they be forgiven of saying, I don't believe. That's the dispute that John is thinking about, I think, here. And he's saying, when Jesus died, his what he did was more important than his life. Now, it's easy for us today to say, well, if I were being persecuted, I'd stand up for Jesus. I'll tell you, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure because I would find all kinds of ways in my mind to say, I'm not really believing that stuff, I'm just saying it so I can get by. This is hard. It's hard because he's saying, you're going to be hated by the world. Some of you are going to be persecuted. Now, we aren't undergoing that kind of persecution right now in this country. But there are in other countries. Look what he says. He says, when the counselor comes in verse 26, whom I will send you from the Father, and the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he'll testify against me. But you must also testify. For you've been with me from the beginning. All this I've told you so you don't go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. Now that was important. Because even if you're a Christian, the synagogue was, we don't have an equivalent for it today. And the closest thing might be Starbucks. Right? <laughs> because it's where the people went just to discuss things with one another. These were small, it was small communities. And uh, there are small communities in America, but here in our city, we don't, we don't necessarily have small communities. Maybe Golden has sort of a community. They kind of, Goldenites kind of think of themselves as special. But <laughs> it, it's hard to find a community like that where if you're actually thrown out of the community. Now, I can tell you that at John's time, John is living in a time when they have specifically said, 
Christians are no longer welcome in the synagogue. During the time of Paul, that wasn't true. Where did Paul go all the time? He went to the synagogue, right, to teach them. Because even though he was teaching them about Christ, that was okay in the synagogue because that's where you learned everything and anybody could say anything. That has changed. So they've been thrown out of the synagogue. He's saying, yeah, you're going to be thrown out of the synagogue. And look at this. A time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I've told you this, so when the time comes, you'll remember I warned you. I didn't tell you this at first because I was with you. Wow. He's saying, he's not saying, I will prevent them from killing you. Doesn't say that, does he? He says, if they kill you, they'll think they're offering a service to God. You ought to see the, the writings from 100 A.D. of the Romans who put Christians to death say exactly that. We are offering a service to our God by killing these people who do not believe in our gods. Because not believing in our gods is undermining our society. Verse 5, chapter 16. I'm going to him who sent me. None of you ask, where are you going? Because I've said these things, you're filled with grief, grief, but I tell you the truth, it's for your good I'm going away. Unless I'm going away, the counselor won't come to you. But if I go, I'll, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he'll convict the world of sin, of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe me, in regard to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Well, that, all this is a pretty powerful statement. He's saying, I've got to die. I've got to die so that you can be convicted of what sin is because you can see that I'm resurrected. So the spirit of truth is going to come to you because you're going to understand the truth. And I'm going to send that spirit of truth to you. In a sense, Jesus is sending it. Because Jesus is the one who had to die. So he's the one who is sending the spirit of truth. All right, continue with this. Verse 12, I have a lot more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when the spirit of truth comes, he's going to guide you into all, all truth. He won't speak on his own, speak only what he hears. He, he will tell you what's yet, yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that the Father, all that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will take from you from what is mine and make it known to you. In a little while you'll see me no more than after a while you'll see me. What a great statement. The disciples are kind of confused. They say to each other in verse 17, what does he mean by, th by this? In a little while you see me no more. They kept asking, what does he mean? Verse 19, Jesus said, saw that they uh, wanted to ask him about this, he said to them, hey, you're asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you'll see me no more, and then in a little while you'll see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. What's he talking about? Well, when he is put to death, you're going to weep and mourn. But the world's going to rejoice at that because they're done with Jesus, right? And then he says, your grief is going to be turned to joy because there's going to be a resurrection. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. When the baby is born, she forgets her anguish because of her joy that the child is born into the world. And I can tell you that's true with most, most women. Right? I mean, when we had our first son, Georgia had great pain. She even asked the doctor to get me out of the delivery room because she was, <laughs> she was tired of my coaching. <laughs> and so, yeah, but, but afterwards she was willing to get pregnant again. Um, and which worked out fine until we had triplets. 
After that, she was not willing to get pregnant again. <laughs> so it's not always true that her grief has turned to joy. <laughs> so, um, not necessarily, but in general, that's, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, we really didn't. Oh no, I, I had them, I had sympathetic pains. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we have uh, a singleton and then two and a half years later we had three. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, where you go from there is you, uh, buy a lot of cribs okay look at what Jesus continues saying he says in verse uh, 25 of chapter 16 I've been speaking figuratively but a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language but will tell you plainly about my father in that day you will ask in my name. I'm not saying I will ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father loves you because you have loved me and have believed I came from God. I came from the Father, entered the world. I'm leaving the world, going back to the Father. The disciples say, now you're speaking clearly. <laughs> I'm not so sure that that's true. But essentially what he's saying is, look, I'm, I'm going to go to be with the Father. You can talk to the Father directly now because I'm going to be with the Father. So don't be afraid to address the Father directly the same way that I do. Just like I've been able to see the Father, I want you to be able to see the Father. Jesus came so we could see God. And we see God when we love each other. I'll tell you, I see God in you. Because you have done some amazing things. Not only for me, but I see amazing things you do for others. That's when you show your love, I see the Father. That's what we need to do. That's what he's telling his disciples. People will see the Father because they see your love. Verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you'll have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. Now Jesus isn't done talking yet. Because now, Jesus looks to heaven and he starts a prayer. And we've talked about that prayer before, but isn't it interesting here that he says, he is praying... First off, this is really the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted authority over all people, so that he might give eternal life to those you've given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought your glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do, now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had before the world began. What's Jesus just asked God to do? Go ahead and kill me here so the world can see that I can be resurrected. That's what he's just said, isn't it? That's how he's going to be glorified. Verse 6. I have revealed you to those who you gave me out of the world. Who is he talking about? The, ele the 11 at this point. Actually, he's talking about the 12. You're going to see him address that in a minute. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the word you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you've given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours and all you have is mine and glory has come to me through them. 
I will remain in the world no longer, but there in the world I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so the scripture would be fulfilled. Who's he talking about? Judas Iscariot. I'm coming to you now. But I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. Who's the they? My eleven, these men standing here right now, uh, they may be standing or sitting, I'll talk about that in a minute. These men who are with me right now may have my joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they true may truly be sanctified. Now we're ready for our part. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Now specifically, John's thinking of the people he's writing this book to in 95 AD. Those are the people who believed through the message of the apostles. Because they heard the apostles directly in 95 AD. It also applies to us. But don't just apply it to us. Remember the context of what's going on here. Look what he prays. I pray for those who will believe in me that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be in us so the world may believe you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them, you in me, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you love me. I want those I have, you have given me to be with you where I am, to see my glory, the glory you've given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know you have sent me. I have made you known to them and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Then it says, when he finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples. It's interesting there. He left with his disciples because if you were paying attention back in 14, at the end of 14, he says, come now, let us leave. So the question is, where was he when he was talking about the vine and when he's talking about doing the prayer? I think the interesting thing is the, there's two possible answers the way I see it. One answer is he's like us. We're at a friend's house and we say, okay, it's time to leave. And then we continue our discussion. Right? And, and we continue our discussion and go on talking to each other for a while. The other thing is, they could have gotten up and left that room. And perhaps as they're walking along is where Jesus sees the vine and tells them about the vine as they're walking on. And then he stops to pray. And now, now he's on his way to the valley. Now, I realize that this morning I've covered a lot and read a lot. But the reason I wanted to do that was I don't think that we read this all in one piece together very often. And I think it's important that we see this piece as one thing that Jesus is trying to tell us. What is the central message of everything that he said here? The central message is
I don't know how many more times he could say it. Is that right? <laughs> okay. He says it over and over because he knows that's what we're going to have trouble with. Now, when he's talking about loving one another, one of the things he talks about there is unity. I will tell you that if we think unity means we're all going to believe the same thing, then we're never going to be united. Unity doesn't mean we're all going to believe exactly the same things. I've told you this before. If I were on a desert island, there would be two churches there. Just me on the desert island. There would be two churches. There would be the church I go to some Sundays, and then when I disagree with myself, there would be the church I go to another Sunday. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> honestly, I argue with myself about all kinds of things. And if, if Christ is calling us to say, don't argue and don't think about things, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to discuss things with one another, but I want you to remember your goal is always the same, to love one another. Now, if we end up saying, I can't love that person, we've missed the point. This is, I think the strongest point that Jesus can make is, I'm telling you to love each other. That's my command. He says, follow my commands. There are going to be people who disagree with me over whether I should have the Lord's Supper every Sunday. There's going to be people who disagree with me over the kind of music. There's people who disagree with me over how we deal with homosexuals. There's people who disagree with me over uh, whether we should be washing each other's feet today. You know what? Love each other. Don't let your doctrine get in the way of loving each other, but also don't be afraid to talk about things with each other. I want you to discuss things with each other because the more you talk about how do we deal with this if we're a Christian, the more we understand how to live our lives. Isn't that why this and the Sermon on the Mount go perfectly with each other? Because the Sermon on the Mount is saying, you've heard it said, don't murder. I tell you, don't even think about murdering. That's what we ought to be discussing. Right? How do I avoid thinking about, I need to kill this guy? Because <laughs> the world would be better off without him. How do I think about not taking something that isn't mine? We need to discuss things with each other so we know how to live. And if we stop talking to each other about things that we can disagree on, then, that, then we're not going to be able to love each other. I need to learn how to love someone else because I need to see how you behave even when you disagree with me. This is really hard for Christians to learn. I mean, I, I'm sad when I look at the, the world of Christianity today. Because all it is, Jesus in his last moments, his last prayer says, love each other and have unity. And you look at the world, man, we don't have that. If Christians were united in their love and said, look, I, I disagree. I, I, don't, I don't think that we should have a person on earth who we're going to call the Pope. I, I don't think that he speaks for God. But I'll tell you what, I know they love God, and that's what our goal is, to love God. Uh, we were in, um, we spent some time in Eastern Europe last year. And in Eastern Europe, we visited some of the uh, Orthodox churches. We visited the Romanian Orthodox Church and maybe the Bulgarian one too, I'm not sure. I don't know where we were. But in those different... 
After a while, one cathedral looks like another. All right? But when you get there and say, man, these people are different. You know, they don't believe that you should sit down during worship. They stand up during their whole worship. They do have benches around the edges for just the elderly who can't stand up. But they believe your whole worship should always be standing up, and especially your prayer should always be standing up. And, and then you go into another place, and they have places where you kneel to pray. Uh, friends, we just want people to pray. <laughs> we need to realize that there are people who love God, and our goal is to help each other love God. And that means we have to love each other and show our love for each other. And we need to be very forgiving of each other, even though you're wrong in so many places. <laughs> that I can biblically show you you're wrong at. I need to love you. Yeah, Jim. Having, having compassion for each other, having an understanding of the other person's feelings, and loving each other. And Christ is pleading with his disciples here to do that. And he's also pleading with us. And that's his prayer. Uh, after this, he's ready to go to be crucified. That's where we'll be next week. Even a little while. Right. I mean, it's going to happen in, within a day. Within a day. It's amazing. Thank you all. We'll see you next week.